shall we begin or shall we wait for one or two minutes more Onuda, Doctor Pobuddha Ganguly is yet to join. Hello. Oh, he is going to join soon. I am going to talk with him. Ah, you have to co-host for him. When when he comes, huh? Oh, are you sure about that? Okay, okay, okay. I am just when I to okay, okay, not a problem, not a problem. ठीक है टेक्निकल एक्टर समस्या Yes, the server has joined. So uh, let us begin. On other, shall we? Hello, on are you there? Yeah. I am audible, right? Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me begin by stating that our principal sir is seriously ill and wounded due to a trauma arising from concussion, so he couldn't be present 
in this online conference on behalf of him and the entire BB College family. Let me, Radoshi Dash, convener, ELAN 2021, welcome all the participants of the two day international e conference in 2021 on library and allied subjects in network. We started this ELAN web venture in the pandemic during the pandemic last year. This year, we have stepped up to a bigger turf by organizing this e conference on a theme contested and curious. I must say that for a mostly UG and partially PG college like ours to attend and deal with such an idea is a rare perhaps in a global uh, global south context the conference not only tries to uh, uh, tries and bring together luminaries of lis and dh field for the first time but also shed lights in some areas which is largely unexplored the themes which is thoughtfully curated and set would i believe would help us to look at various joined and conjoined areas of lis and dh Talking about the pandemic, as we know and seen that library building from we have moved from a library building to a website building. The shift has been more pronounced during this time, but the process is already has been on the roll. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, for example, we have seen <coughs> we have seen the huge scale that achieve, that has been achieved for a for for digitization project coming out of various digitization project and the the examples could be brought forward of european collections google's art and cultures world digital library ndli in our countries so on and so forth they have brought forward huge cultural data not only for a qualitative analysis, but also for quantitative information generation in the in the form of, as we know, counts and numbers suitable for statistical analysis. This uh, DH is, a, as I already mentioned, is a curious term. Uh, it has several uh, entry points, one of them being the library, which uh, uh, which used digital uh, tools and taxonomical methods far uh, far before than any other departments, and these scholars and librarians has uh, has this uh, has this uh, relation that goes far before the present time. But the crisis in digital is also very uh, pronounced. The main problem of the quick obsolescence of the digital modes and methods and of course the cost factor as we have seen the many uh, cost effective economical dh projects cannot keep up with the continuous requirements of updation and upgradation eventually fail one such instance may be one of the most used and beloved online tools in classics the parsus digital library the uh, the its new release came only in march 2018 after the uh, after the 15 years of its first updation. So therefore, we many a times we have to deal with outdated, crowded or clunky sites. Uh, therefore, this is a big problem in everything digital. And I also believe that librarian and DH enthusiasts need to be very cautious when describing some objects as markers for future retrieval. They must make a choice whether they are encoding a line of text using the text encoding initiatives markup specification to identify the speech of character for programmatic manipulation or activities, or creating searchable metadata tags for digital libraries. The choice to be made has to be on the values of sustainability and, of course, also the taxonomical affordance of the available toolset. Having said that, uh, uh, the, 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 this behavior, the selection and choice in library and archives need to be looked at with uh, critical and eyes and with thorough examination. Uh, this should be far from obvious and mechanical because as we know, the 
duration, the selection, and the categorization is deeply uh, political. The, the very act is very political. The, the genetic data standards, for example, Dublin Code Metadata Initiative or something like that, written basically for broad interpretation, are not neutral and adopt a particular worldview. If I, if I can remind the criticism of the feminist and queer theorist that, 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 that critics of data highlight the places where these standards begin to break and foregrounding the gaps and silences in the systems of representation. Uh, to, in a simple terms, these global uh, standards coming out of global north, as the name suggests, say for example, Anglo-American Cataloging Code or Dublin Code Metadata Initiative, uh, they are in, in at times uh, unmindful or indifferent to the culture heritage of the local. The, uh, the criticism of these standards also highlight the need to go beyond the binary and hierarchical relationship that is very prevalent in a library and uh, library and all the structures of the memory institutions in its data models offered as offered by ontologies or other database systems uh, but rather the newly emerged rtf and linked data which is very also when it dear to me are are seen as less rigid constructs that allow for data complexities to be expressed in a far more open and democratic way. We have also seen uh, various other occasions where LIS professionals and DH, uh, DH community uh, have joined hands, most notably in the courtroom scenario where the DH enthusiasts and LIS professionals came together to uh, to to uh, support the case of uh, uh, scanning uh, uh, rights of Google and Hathi Trust, and they uh, put forward the amicus in uh, in the US, and they put forward the amicus brief of with in in uh, collaboration with the law professors and other enthusiasts of, uh, and enthusiasts for open access. So. Therefore, we have seen the uh, this uh, space of DH and LIS interesting and uh, and and uh, gives birth to very um, various opportunities and also criticism and problem. Uh, without further ado, may I request uh, today's guest of honor speaker, Professor Dr. Prabuddha Ganguly, CEO of Vision IPR Mumbai India visiting professor Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law, co-PI National Digital Library of India, Indian Institute of Technology and Kharagpur, India, and also the advisor of Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur, to please uh, deliver his talk, sir. Sir, this is over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure to join all of you this morning uh, for this uh, international conference. Um, before I really start on this, I must congratulate the organizers for organizing this uh, fantastic uh, conference. Um, what I wish to do is instead of going into nitty gritty details of everything, I will take a broad overview of the subject. And therefore, I have titled my spe uh, you know, talk as recontouring knowledge in emerging societies. So recontouring knowledge in emerging societies, there are two mm, elements. One is the emerging societies. So what are those emerging societies? Therefore, these emerging societies will have their own knowledge needs, will have their needs out there. And therefore, how do we recontour the knowledge space to really take care of the requirements of this new and emerging societies. So what I'd like to do is straight away, is, is my slide visible? Is the slide visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so this is the topic and the entire presentation, as you will see on the left side of the title slide, says the attribution 
is non-commercial share alike, which is CCBY, NCSA. Therefore, whatever I speak today and whatever I present today is actually being licensed under the digital commons with an attribution of non-commercial share alike. And which means that this license lets all of you to remix, adapt, and build upon this work non-commercially, that's very important, as long as you credit the author and license your creations under the same uh, and identical terms. Having said this, let us just go quickly into the whole aspect of how we have evolved, how have societies evolved? Because after all, we are doing everything for our society. So if you take about 2 million years ago, which was the birth of the human beings, basically it was coexistence with nature and a hunting society. So basically it was all with raw materials and agricultural products. Then came in development of irrigation techniques and then firm establishment of settlements. So the agrarian society uh, was born. And therefore this whole concept of natural products and development of that. Then came in the next step, which is our industry, the whole orientation of the industrial products, where a whole range of inventions came in. Science developed, technologies developed, and therefore the whole industrial society took on. And therefore you had our society was split between an industrial society and an agrarian society. So you are the two and the ratio would change from time to time. Then came in what? In the latter half of the 20th century came in the information products and therefore came in invention of computers, start of information distribution and the information society of which we are all a part out there. And therefore you now had three types of societies together to form this part, which was the Nagarian society, the industrial society, and the information society. Then what happened in the last few years? In the last uh, decade and a half, we have moved to what is known as a society five, society 5.0, which is a super smart society, and which brings innovative knowledge products and services, the context in which we are having this particular conference. But do we stop there? The point is no, we are going ahead. So what I'm saying is that society 5.0, which is a super smart society has its own needs of knowledge. It has its own needs of knowledge products and services. And it has a mix of all these other societies. But then as we go further, you know, let us look at what has happened over these years. Over these years, in the last so many million years, People began to communicate, and therefore the evolution of communication came in through pictograms, you know, petroglyphs, you know, then in terms of clay uh, builds, the Egyptian heliographs, uh, Greek Roman alphabets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, out there. So these, as you can see, these were actually sculptured on, you know, different media, on different surfaces, on. Uh, different ways. So it was something that you had to put on. It was it was a way of writing. And so writing was on some surface. So that is one way of communication. So evolution of communication took place in this particular form. Then what happened? Then the whole issue of documentation and communication came in. You know, we had the communication system, the postal system, which was very advanced in Persia, India, and China, then you had different forms of, you know, communication, smoke signals, pigeon post, printing made a major technological impact. In fact, printing was invented about in, you know, in around 1450 or so. And you know that it brought in a complete disruptive transformation in society. And then came in a whole bunch of other documentation communication means finally from the typewriter, telephone, television, computers, and now into artificial intelligence. So 
You have a whole range of developments that have taken place uh, over all these few million years out there. And today we are at the cusp of a, a very different society. So what is that society <clears throat> that we are sitting in today or will be seeing in the next 50 to the next 100 years? How do we see that? And so before I come to that, I just wanted to point out to you that <clears throat> these timelines of communication tools are very well documented out there. And you can see that mobile 4G networks came in around 2012, and now we are already in 5G networks, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole range of changes have taken place, and therefore communities have evolved. Over these times, the needs have evolved, the documentation process have changed, the communication systems have changed, and that's how it has taken place. And you can see that initially, the changes took a very long time, but now the changes are very rapid. Now, therefore, what is, and now if you take the latest part, you know, with all the systems that we are developing today, we are at the cusp of brain-to-brain -brain, uh, communication and brain mapping. I mean, just imagine what a fantastic development has taken place. So brain, on one side it's brain, the other side it's mind. Therefore, the difference between brain and mind, you know, brain is something very physical, mind is something which is, you know, which is, uh, you can say, is not so physical. So the question that comes in, this type of, brain uh, mind interface is is creating a completely new uh, paradigm in society and therefore under these circumstances what is the society that we are finally going to see say in the coming 50 years or so and i call it i'm calling it society 6.5 i'm saying there are titanic transformations we as human beings or homo sapiens is one species that's going to be there. Then there will be augmented homo sapiens with embedded systems. We will embed different types of AI and other type of devices in our bodies. And therefore, we will have augmented homo sapiens with embedded systems. We will have autonomous AI systems. We'll have robots. And I'm differentiating robots from autonomous AI systems. And then a very interesting step of species will develop. That is because we are getting into an augmented homo sapien status, the biology will take over and in due course, we will mutate where certain type of you know, characteristics of humans or homo sapiens will get selectively suppressed and certain things will get selectively enhanced. And therefore there'll be AI induced mutated humans over time. So you will have all these types of species and therefore this new hybrid society will come and, and interface to construct new ways of organizing life together and we'll have to plan for it out there and see what are the consequences of all these developments and the development of society 6.5 as i call it now all these as i say today are being driven by 5g wireless networks quantum computing, deep learning and big data, mind-to-mind -mind communication, and then replace the internet is being replaced, all weaved and embroidered with converging technologies and cyber infrastructure, including 3D printing, AR and VR. What are they doing? They're seamlessly unifying the physical, digital, and biological worlds. So when you come to that sort of a situation, what is happening? The AI systems, are learning to be more human. Question is, are humans learning to be more humane? And therefore, the knowledge needs and the knowledge constructs that we are talking about must try and take us to more of these humane type of qualities out there as we, as human beings, utilize all these technologies for the betterment of society. And therefore, the issues that come about are like, one is, of course, we will have to look at the people per se. We'll have to look at the planet. We'll have to look at the prosperity of the planet. We'll have to look for peace and 
very a new model of partnerships that will come about and that is going to be the role of knowledge seekers knowledge uh, archivers knowledge givers and knowledge propagators and that's where libraries are transforming in their role you know completely new paradigm so that's the way i see society 6.5 evolving and titanic transformations taking place in these now when we go to the next step and that is when you take information and knowledge we go through thought we go to expression of ideas and then it translates into reality what is happening today just some quick in, you know information that amount of data being captured increases by 40% every year very interesting data seems to be increasing by leaps and bounds in 2025 the digital universe will reach 180 zettabytes unbelievable but the time cycles are collapsing and knowledge is doubling every 11 to 12 hours so as i speak the knowledge content in the world is really you know galloping forward and there is no time to equilibrate between yesterday today tomorrow and the days after so it's in a completely dynamic state of turmoil so we will have to manage intelligently we have to manage this particular state of turmoil in all our daily proceedings be it in education be it in industry be it in our daily lives so this is the world that we are going towards and all our efforts will have to be focused into something where we will make the world a happier place to live in despite all these tremendous changes that are taking place let's go further into it i won't go into details all of you are aware of the you know sustainable development goals and there are you know 17 of them and we will see how we are going to address some of these through our knowledge networks etc let's go further so therefore when we come to knowledge societies the first part is human needs and rights the foundations on which it is built on or will be built on is pluralism inclusion equity and openness now you will see these terms pluralism inclusion equity and openness now if you take these terms and put them together you will find that there is a lot of tension between each of these terms and between these terms and therefore the four key principles based on which we are looking at knowledge societies would be freedom of expression universal access diversity and education for all these are the basic principles and therefore how will we service them we will service them through knowledge creation knowledge preservation knowledge dissemination and knowledge utilization this is where libraries and all other information and knowledge systems come in where they help in knowledge creation knowledge preservation knowledge dissemination and knowledge utilization and all these converge to what i would call into knowledge societies and that's what we want to build and that's what the libraries and that's what all the information scientists all the man, you know information management personnel will go through as we go in time now let's take the next step and that is there's a very big aspect which we often ignore and that is the knowledge domain is actually split into two two i would say two zones one knowledge which is unconstrained public use open domain knowledge where i can use you can use anybody can use without any restrictions and there is an owned knowledge domain which is for controlled public use you may have access but you cannot use it now this is where the whole concept of intellectual property rights come in and therefore we need to look at the how are we are we contracting the unconstrained knowledge domain and are we increasing the owned knowledge domain or if we need the point is we need both question is how do we strike a balance between the unconstrained public use domain and the owned knowledge which is a controlled public use domain so the question that comes in a big tension between the two is 
that's where all the uh, debates are now converging as to a it's well recognized that intellectual property rights in a certain form are that is there to stay and yet we are saying that we want open uh, domain we want open access we want there how do we strike that balance and how do we bring in a, a some sort of an equitable uh, relationship between the two that's going to be a big challenge for us and we need to address that particular thing as we go along so the question that comes in therefore that right from 1948 i won't go into details of this all of you are probably familiar with all these that the international covenant on Econo economic social and cultural rights which came into force in 3rd january 1976 the universal declaration of human rights proclaimed by the united nations general assembly in 10 on 10 december 1948 and the united nations declaration of rights of indigenous people of 2007 all these talk about how do you bring in this particular balance between that open domain and the the constraint the domain of intellectual property rights with recognizing that right to education right to knowledge right to living etc etc is a very fundamental requirement of human beings out there then we go into the latest startup which the latest concept of open educational resource i i call it knowledge rehabilitation now in this knowledge rehabilitation what has unesco done it has come in with open educational resources where our teaching learning and research materials in any medium digital or otherwise that reside in public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access that please drown the word no cost access use adaptation and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions and this is the concept of the unesco's open educational resource questions to be asked it says that permits no cost access question that will come in all the time and i will raise this question towards the end of the talk will be when we say no cost access who pays for the development of knowledge who pays for creating all this infrastructure who pays for all the aspects so the question that comes in that tension between the so called no cost or low cost are we talking about no cost or low cost or reasonable cost and equitable distribution of benefits these are the new models of, that will come in in knowledge transactions as we go on in the future if we want to achieve all the um, sdg goals for which is quality education gender equality industry innovation infrastructure reduce inequalities within and across countries peace justice strong institutions etc etc so now we go to to the part and therefore as of latest on 2nd march 2020 they have established a oer dynamic coalition and this is where the hope to implement the dream of oer and we'll have to see how we interface in doing all these and taking it further as i go to the next step onto it out there i bring in immediately into it our own national education policy 2020 which says for an empowered knowledge society where we say we will use a technology extensively we say that there will be a national repository of high quality resources for foundational literacy very important and available to digital infrastructure for knowledge sharing diksha access to downloadable printable versions of all text mind you all textbooks will be provided for all states now this all is a thing which says to conserve environment and reduce logistical burden steps to be taken to enhance online accessibility of library books and further broad basing of digital libraries creating a dedicated unit for building a world class digital infrastructure educational digital content and capacity and ensuring equitable use of technology content creation digital repository and dissemination so these are all the dreams of the national education policy 2020 and we'll have to you can see that already these are very very broad umbrella dreams 
And to make them happen, we'll have to really go deep into each one of them at a very micro level and see how we will implement this and what will be the role of our libraries and archival systems and knowledge management. So when we come to libraries, archives, museums, what is the role of information knowledge management? Number one, libraries, archives, and museums are custodians or diverse works catering to information knowledge needs of their users. So what do you, what do, you do? You procure works. Most of them are copyrighted and non-copyrighted in various forms, physical and digital, and make them accessible to consumers by a plethora of services. You participate with the users in the process of creation of works. And also, the libraries and archives exploit diverse media for publishing. And therefore, all information and knowledge management professionals must have a basic understanding of intellectual property rights, especially copyright, becomes a very fundamental and a very basic tenet that we need to be aware of as to what we can, what we cannot, what we should, and what we shouldn't do as we uh, progress with our profession. Let's go further. And therefore, the first part is where we need to recon to the knowledge space, digital and non-digital, for repurposing. And what do I mean by repurposing? Reuse, revise, remix, retain, redistribution. And to do this, the first thing that we need to do as information and knowledge professionals is to look at what are the amendments that we require to the copyright laws and what are those exceptions within the copyright laws that we have so that those exceptions should permit the users to permit the users of for reuse the repurposing purposes of reuse revise remix retain redistribution and as a community <clears throat> we must address <clears throat> these features <clears throat> in fact at the moment this is the right moment to address this because the government of india is actually now looking at how to amend our copyright laws and bring in you know things which would be favorable uh, for implementation of the um, national education policy so we have to apply our minds and as a community really come and immediately propose what are those types of amendments that we need in our copyright laws so that we can do all these repurposing aspects in there and which would actually facilitate our things i won't go into details of it most of you are aware therefore you need the next step of recontouring the data domain where the concept of fair data is known which is findable accessible interoperable and reusable and these are already terms which are being used and therefore very important for us to find out the first step of reusing data is to first find them. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and computers. Machine readable metadata are essential for automatic discovery of data sets and services so that this is essential component of the verification process. Accessible. Once the user finds the required data, they need to know how they can be accessed, possibly including authentication and authorization. Very important. Interoperable. And this is where we suffer from in this country, that everyone creates a database, but they are not interoperable. So everybody you know, duplicates and does everything all over again. Very important. We must recognize that these are the challenges in front of us, reusable. So how do we reuse the metadata and how do we go about doing all these particular features are issues that we need to address very, very urgently in our country. So therefore, I come to the point that the impact of evolving digital technologies and the present day IPR laws do not adequately address the challenge of, e of the evolving digital ecosystem. What is true for the physical world is not necessarily true for the digital world. Laws that apply to the physical world do not necessarily apply to the digital ecosystem. And therefore, we need to address some of these issues very, very um, <clears throat> systematically and urgently. Similarly, if you look at the issues, what, there's another very major issue, and that is 
moment we bring in autonomous artificial intelligence systems, which have human-like attributes, they generate, they generate knowledge themselves without involvement of humans anymore. Once you have created the AI system and it learns through deep learning methods, it becomes an autonomous artificial intelligence system. It creates, it begins to create. Question that comes in, would you then give personhood to such systems? Would you call the AI systems as persons? And the moment you call them as persons, because they will be a part of our lives. And the moment you give them personhood, the entire paradigm changes and the whole knowledge domain will go into a completely rupture and we'll have to look at how to handle the knowledge domain the moment you have you address issues of personal to artificial intel autonomous artificial intelligence systems and therefore the knowledge dynamics in society 6.5 will be in very rugged territories and therefore post digital knowledge socialization and these mark these terms post digital knowledge socialism democratization of knowledge and knowledge capitalism will be under severe test Knowledge capitalism coming through intellectual property rights and utilization of the knowledge, socialization and democratization going through the openness part. And with that tension is going to be a very tough tension for us to resolve. And therefore, as we go along, I, you go into you know, exploring untrodden paths. And I think this conference probably addresses some of them. But I'm asking a question. Can we create in national and regional knowledge pools and knowledge cooperatives. Can we have knowledge cooperatives? The concept of cooperatives. How do you bring things together? <clears throat> Just as we are cooperatives, you know, we have farming cooperatives, we have other types of cooperatives. Can we have a knowledge cooperative? In which case, what are going to be the rules of a knowledge cooperative? How will we operate a knowledge cooperative so that we have a system, you know, of licensing, or utilization of the knowledge with the principles of fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory nature. And yet, we do cross-pollination of information and knowledge. And yet, we bring in the openness that we need. Can we set up, like the World Bank, like the International Monetary Fund, can we have a World Knowledge Bank, including an International Knowledge Fund, to facilitate affordable knowledge access you know, to nations who need these particular bits. So we need to really look at all these very carefully. I'd just like to end my talk by bringing in the major, uh, a, a great uh, project in the, in the country by way of National Digital Library of India, which was initiated by the Ministry of Education out there and being run in IIT Kharagpur. That's the website. And today, the National Digital Library of India, what does it do? It does not store anything. What it does is that it becomes a gateway. It becomes a gateway to knowledge. So you can see that it says that there are, you know, so many resources out there. And you can search all these resources free of cost. You can do them free of, um, you know, copyright issues. And therefore, we need to look at all these things very, very carefully. And what we recently did is that you can see on the top saying new copyright guide. And we launched it on 12th of uh, August this year. And that is this copyright guide for Indian libraries. And I would urge all of you as librarians and information professionals to go there, download it and st uh, study it. And you can um, you know, use it. And we have addressed a whole range of issues that come that all librarians and uh, um, you know, and, and information professionals and knowledge professionals face in India as a result of the Copyright Act, and therefore this will give you a complete understanding of that particular process out there. Just last but not the least, therefore I'm saying emerging societies and knowledge are they pulling apart? So if this end is emerging societies, and if this is the knowledge we need are the two pulling apart so if it pulls apart neither of them can get the benefit so what are, what do such conferences do such conferences bring people together it is time to reflect 
and ponder for societal good. So now you can see that we all are thinking. And then what do we do? After that, we find a solution. Together, instead of pulling each other, we go on one side and take the benefit. And they can go to the other side and take the benefit. Well, this is what I had to say. And therefore, I wish the conference the very best and all success. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, wonderful speech on recontouring knowledge in emerging societies. Sir, myself, Shanton, uh, I would just like to ask you a simple question, a simple query, sir. Please, uh, please. Uh, do you believe that as time goes on, futuristic technology, uh, such as society, as we have discussed, could have become more cost effective or it may cause exclusion further? Very good question. See, the, on one hand, these type of societies that are there, right? They, you know, if we don't utilize it properly, it will create a lot of exclusion. And therefore, very consciously, we'll have to tread that path and see how to really address these particular aspects to ensure that we do not create a bigger, um, uh, we do not create a bigger divide because the whole idea is to converge and not divide. And therefore, we have to be very careful. And that's the reason I brought on the issue of socialism and capitalism. So we'll have to go into economic theories. We'll have to go into those different processes and address some of these issues. Yes, the, it's not going to be that simple an answer. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your inviting talk. Um, uh, may I request have to stop screen sharing? Yeah, I will have to stop the screen sharing. So yeah, yeah. Thank you so minute. much. Not I a problem. Will, Let me, just... There has been a little reschedule in our uh, program. Instead of Dr. Partha Sharati Mukhopadhyay, now uh, Dr. Sushmita Chakravarti would present his case. Uh, is that gone off? Just wanted to check. Is the presentation gone? Yeah, yeah, it's gone, sir. Lovely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Shushmita Chakravarti is a professor and head Department of Library and Information Science, University of Calcutta. Professor Chakravarti is the secretary, standing committee section on education and training, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, and also the editor of IFLA, the said bulletin. If, as we know, the umbrella organization of all national associations in library and information science, Dr. Chakraborty was a Commonwealth fellow and a visiting academic in University College London, United Kingdom uh, during uh, 2015. She was awarded many awards, uh, most notably Bonnie Hitch International Library Award uh, from San Diego, USA 2013, and also Momentum Press Award from Boston, USA 2014, and SLA Rising Star Award from Vancouver, Canada 2015. Now it's over to you, ma'am, for your case. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dash. Let me share my uh, presentation and also a word uh, file. I'll be sharing with you, dignitaries and participants. So, can you hear me clearly? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, So, uh, at this, at the onset, I would like to thank all organizers of ELAN 2021 International E-Conference on Library and Allied Subjects in Network. My special thanks goes to the young and dynamic librarian, Mr. Rajor Shidash, who has so kind enough to invite me for this speech, for this keynote address. I'm really 
flattered and proud to take part in such a such an innovative event so uh, i will render my thanks to dr amitabh boshu principal banwari lal valotia college and chairperson e land 2021 my my thanks also goes to dr arjun ghosh professor department of humanities and social sciences indian institute of technology delhi and also to my co panelist and keynote addressee uh, professor partho sharathi mukhopadhyay of kolani university i would like to offer my sincere thanks to the participants also for giving their valuable time and energy to hear this talk as we know web space or information super highway is a very interesting place now it is more frequently traveled than our high roads and by roads in our physical space so this is a podium where we can share our thoughts on the latest that is happening in this travel so my fellow travelers today i would like to uh, share with you some ideas about how i see social media and today's travelers of web space are connected with each other so social media and libraries social media and libraries what do we know about social media social media is a web 2.0 activity where networks and communities are connected with each other in a very well managed way and there are elements of chaos as well so this is a very efficient platform for communication of content next is what are the goals of this social media it is to produce library materials products and services also to help the information super highway travelers in their networking goals it also offers an effective channel that fosters communication with the users through social networking platforms rajoshi phone korle dio and it is also a channel where informed users can be actively involved in the communication of information process through meta tagging and so many other ways you can also use social media for library uh, marketing also promotion and marketing of your services and products librarians and information scientists can be coordinated together can share their ideas through this social media in a very unique and innovative way so facebook is the most prominent in this sphere as we know this is free a social networking website you can create profiles upload photos video messages 
and also you can be connected with your friends family and colleagues it, now it is becoming synonymous with gestar search which is very very useful for research you know higher education and research uh, use this gstor gestar tool very much and wolcat wolcat can solve your uh, devices to uh, through the use of facebook you can use gestar tool so instead of gestar people are using this tool what tool the tool is facebook so there are facebook and several other tools which are useful for uh, innovative uh, communication in research and higher education so one sec we'll be sharing the ppt okay so so uh, after this work maybe a very prominent tool that is used uh, for the purpose of promoting your libraries and communicating with users is twitter twitter as you know is microblogging tool and uh, as a social networking device it has its ultimate use in uh, uh, communicating cryptic small lines and information so if you want to promote your library a uh, conference throughout the world this may be your way to go through and there are this instant messages which is most useful next is youtube as a uh, head of the department now in calcutta university we are celebrating our platinum jubilee we have completed our uh, 75 years of our existence in 2019 but due to pandemic we are celebrating right now so in all celebration we use you to you for recording and spreading our webinars our lectures of the month our uh, workshops and other programs so you in youtube we have our channel to promote all these uh, activities of our department and it will be used as a resource in uh, days to come so this uh, restoration of resources is also there there is the linkedin linkedin is a professional device which is used by us all librarians and library teachers and students and scholars of lis to connect with the wider circle of friends and colleagues within the domain of our uh, our subject and you know one of the beautiful thing about it that you can go across disciplines so multidiscipline attitude towards internet working ourselves with luminaries of other fields also is present in our linkedin device so linkedin is very very useful and as uh, we all know job hunters use linkedin profile to present impressive uh, cvs and recommendations and job uh, givers they also use linkedin for catching up bright young fellows for promising positions there is the blog weblog is one unique space web space which is used by our libraries to to connect with its users in these days of pandemic blogs are our path path to the hearts and use of the education 
and research communities. There are numerous library blogs, wikis as we know from Wikipedia, it started it, the spreading of using a tool which can be used simultaneously by so many uh, communities. So wiki is one tool where persons from all over the world can develop an idea. It will be the brainchild of collective scholarship. So wiki is such a very useful and unique tool for higher education and research communication. There are this speaker, there is this speaker, speaker is beautiful for sharing your uh, images and as someone told quite aptly, one uh, image can represent a documentation for 100 pages. So if you want to convey through your images, the library can promote its goods through Flickr tool. Library thing is beautiful web application and loved by the catalogers, loved by the librarians. It is used also by authors, individuals and publishers too. There are, as you can see from these, there are so many users and so many books have been catalogued using library thing. So all our young professionals can uh, give a hand to use it. There are this Library of Congress uh, with its wide area of activities. Among that, its presence is felt in Facebook, in Twitter, in Flickr, and in YouTube. So why not we, the librarians, I know many of you, young librarians, you are using social media in a very big way. So uh, now I will, uh, uh, I will try to share some uh, very good examples of, of what uh, are the use of social media by my fellow librarians. So some noteworthy examples uh, are, I hope, uh, I hope you can see it, see it. I am uh, sharing a word file. Okay, so there are beautiful blogs like Library Connect from USA where um, best practices in librarianship are being uh, um, being focused on. There is the Open Library blog from California. There is the Kendio Vidyalaya DRDO Library blog in Bangalore, our own India, Indian blog uh, from the libraries. Uh, and there are the library information used Buffalo State University, which is very, very widely spread among the librarians and library users. There are the distant librarian uh, for um, in Canada, which serves, uh, which is connected with the university in Alberta, and it is a, a blog about a librarian, and you can get inspired by reading this blog. There are the mm, there are the library returners blog. This is a unique blog, you know. Uh, if you have taken a break from your career in librarianship and after some years you want to return to it, your um, library returners blog can be the right step on the way. It can be your tool, useful tool. There is the uh, Makta, uh, Makta Bios blog where um, library news are being focused. There are the Library and Information Technology Association blog, uh, litablog.org. Uh, there is the Library Journal blog, blog, which gives you analytical news reports, Library Science Center blog in Madhya Pradesh, India. Um, it, it is developed by Ovinoy uh, Stoti, uh, a library science professional. Uh, if you are there, uh, hats off to you. 
uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ovinar, uh, there is this li National Library of Australia blog, which is a very uh, worthy example uh, for these. There are uh, other blogs like Leap Focus in Irish um, libraries. There is this Kin Librarian for young uh, professionals in librarianship from UK. There is this library writer's blog. Uh, it will help you to uh, prepare your presentations on LIS matters. Uh, it will groom you in technical writing and all. There is this public libraries online to coordinate between themselves. There is a LSE blog that is uh, for children, you know. <coughs> Sorry. There is this blog uh, for children, which will really help you if, are, if you are working in a children's library, you can contact with them. Ameri American Libraries Magazine, they also run a blog um, and it uh, gives uh, the voice of the profession. Um, it is uh, the focus of this blog. There are the super library marketing blog in uh, Ohio. Um, where, um, you know, where we all have uh, presented uh, our papers in the World Librarian Information Science Congress some years back. So there are other library blogs uh, called iLibrarian, uh, Police News, ACRL, Library of Congress has a beautiful blog. There are the virtual development blog. There are the DV blog uh, for the DV lovers, you know, all around the globe. There are the UL library blog, law librarian can use, law librarian's blog. There is the planet cataloging, a beautiful resource for the catalogers. Except for that, librarians are not only using library blogs, um, but librarians are also into use of other social media tools in a very good way. So they use Twitter and you can uh, get the presence of Twitter. IFLA has presence, IFLA and its section has prominent presence in all the social media tools. And, uh, and also there are the other um, uh, Twitter tools like library and uh, library, uh, <laughs> it's uh, difficult to pronounce, you know. So uh, there are the um, different uh, tweeters, which is uh, very, very useful for these librarians. Australian librarians are using um, uh, Twitter. IFLA is using Twitter. Um, library of Congress is using Twitter. Library Journal. All prominent libraries are using Twitter. If you are not into it, please try using Twitter and give scripting and script and very short sucking sentences to promote your event, to promote your collection. What is the uniqueness of your collection? What are the research tools your um, library has? Please promote it to Twitter too. So there are the wiki tools used by Queen's University, National Ar Archives of United Kingdom, uh, McMaster University, and there are the social bookmarking tool. Uh, you know, I am also in Delicious. Delicious is a very useful tool, very old uh, tool, um, and it was uh, divided into some part, Dell, then CEO, then US, but ultimately they have taken this now name delicious because you know how delicious is, it sounds and how palatable it is, where you can do bookmarking. When you like one uh, digital resource, then you can mark it and you can go to different uh, collaborative ideas. You can mark those two and your own library is uh, prepared. And such a good library is being prepared by Delicious by uh, the marking of choice by the reputed scholars in LIS. So Delicious is a beautiful resource, very unique resource, which can 
um, which can be of great use for LIS and uh, librarians uh, uh, in UK and USA. I know all my friends over um, uh, over and abroad are using Delicious, uh, and they like it very much. So social working tools are Flickr are there. Yeah, all of you, I am sure, are into Flickr. But you know, we when we use uh, Flickr for our personal photographs, there are other tools you know for photographs. But some of them have been discontinued. But uh, if you use Flickr for personal photographs, that is outside the periphery of our talk. But what we are concerned that we can use Flickr for promoting our activities, promoting LIS activities, and Library of Congress and other important libraries are using Flickr for such innovative ideas. YouTube, all conferences in LIS, even this one, are using YouTube right now because of its wide distribution among the visitors of the conference, of the audience of the conference, and also its mechanisms of uh, recording the video with uh, definitely embedded audio and other features within the uh, panorama of this, uh, of this URL that is provided by you. So if you have a class, if you are a, a teacher librarian, you if you have a meeting or a class in between uh, half an, for half an hour or one hour, you can go back to this resource and uh, can explore this uh, resource at your leisure. So uh, learning at your space, at your time, which is the motto of today's uh, Google generation. There are slide share and other tools uh, as you know, we veteran librarians are uh, aware of slides here from so many years uh, right now. And uh, you can get uh, beautiful presentations in slide share, uh, uh, like a Scottish library is using it here uh, in this example. But you know, most of the us librarians are using slide share to uh, to share our PPTs and uh, I, I, I am seeing in the chat box and the comment box that many are asking for the PPT and definitely it will be shared in slide share and please uh, remember that in the first slide I have shown you uh, my uh, personal web page the URL of my personal web page is shared I will share it again with Dr. Rajoshi Dash and uh, I will uh, ask him to share it with you and uh, you can see it. I will share it in my Facebook page also. You can uh, say, uh, use that uh, my personal website, all my uh, journal articles, uh, presentations, everything, the link will be there. Okay. And you can also write to me. Okay. So in Facebook, there is the geek, the library, you know, the geeks. Geeks are the um, persons who are not very conversant with the usual uh, uh, usual talks, small talks, we can say, and gossips of the usual folk. But uh, geeks are very knowledgeable persons. They are highly deep into <coughs> intellectual discussions. And we have some geeks among our librarians. So Geek the Library celebrates those librarians. There are the British Library, there are the British Library uh, Twitters, uh, and also um, uh, Facebook page. There are other examples um, also, but as uh, time and uh, um, place is not suitable, so um, it was uh, not my good fortune to share a longer presentation with you, but uh, I would request you, uh, I would request you to um, uh, just look at, uh, look at the first page of my, uh, oh, sorry, it's not there. Uh, just one minute. Uh, where is the presentation? Oh, sorry. I, uh, I will share the. 
I will share my personal web page link uh, later, maybe. Okay, uh, it is in Google site. Okay, uh, so uh, I would very much like to like you to go through my personal website for the detailed um, papers and. And also detailed paper, and also uh, the presentations uh, in different national, international places. And uh, um, with another thanks uh, to all of you, I uh, end here. And before I end, I will request uh, all of you to uh, go on video just for a second, so that I can take a picture. Rajoshi, uh, please, uh, can you please request everyone to be on uh, video for just one sec? And yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. Take one or two pictures. Uh, just to may we request for all the participants to please switch on their videos so, so as to capturing a uh, photograph, perhaps? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rajushi and uh, dignitaries, as well as participants. Uh, you know who is today's audience. He or she is tomorrow's dignitary. You know, all of us started as uh, young professionals. Now have become old and experienced gradually with the interaction with so many knowledgeable persons. I hope all of you, young professionals, uh, to have a very bright future and to love libraries and knowledge centers uh, as your heart. Uh, uh, okay, uh, as, as the nerve center of knowledge activities, including higher education and research. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for such an in-depth discussion of current tools. Uh, uh, let me uh, let me let me relate to the participants that uh, the, all the links that ma'am has been uh, discussed about will be shared with them eventually. Uh, now our pre, uh, our Rajoshi. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I just uh, will request you. To, uh, I have to leave because I have a meeting with my pro uh, respected professor academic regarding our uh, entering conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, now our current speaker is Dr. Parthu Sharathi Mukhopadhyay. He needs no introduction, uh, but for the sake of the multidisciplinarity of this conference, let me announce that uh, Dr. Uh, Mukhopadhyay is a well-known luminary in LIS and other fields and Professor Mukhopadhyay is a professor in Library and Information Science and is currently the head of the department of LIS in Kollan University. Professor Mukhopadhyay has a long list of honors to his name. One such awards that he received was the Yaslik's Best Young Elias Teacher Award. He is an open source enthusiast and has worked as a developer and promoter of many open source projects. He has more than 100 papers in journals and conference volumes and five uh, books in his beeline. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Mukhopadhyay to please uh, start his deliberation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, Rajusri, for all the kind words. Uh, I think I'm uh, loud and clear to all of you. Yes, sir. You are. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let me directly make a quantum jump uh, into my uh, topic today. That is GLAM, uh, because your broader topic is, uh, you know, uh, that uh, library and allied network. So library may be considered as the memory chip of the society. But library is not alone uh, the only memory chip in the society. There are many other preservation institutes, like you say, galleries, libraries, museums, archives. So many preservation institutes are uh, there, and nowadays people are uh, trying to uh, make you know uh, uh, trying not to operate in isolation. They want to now integrate with each other because technology supports that. 
So in that particular context, as you came to know from Rajoshi, I am an out and out practical person. I always, you know, uh, I do first, then I present that. So uh, uh, I will be showing you that uh, what is the uh, present scenario of this uh, particular integration of different, uh, you know, preservation institutes. What are the models? Uh, modeling is going on, data modeling, and how we can do it with uh, open source software and open standards. So. With this, I will uh, keep my video feed off. Again, if there is any question, I will on my video feed. And uh, I'm now trying to share my presentation and with little bit of uh, live demo uh, uh, following by the presentation. Please someone report me when my presentation will be visible to all of you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. It's visible, sir. Okay, fine. So as you as you can see from here, that it's a glam basically uh, integrating cultural heritage resources in a library retrieval. As I said in preamble, that uh, libraries should not operate in isolation. All memory institutions should come together uh, to form a network kind of thing. And what are the, my, our immediate neighbors in this particular context? This immediate neighbors it is called a uh, glam galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And uh, unfortunately, these are basically retrieval silos in a typical library setup. Now, what, what do I mean by silo? So let me explain that first. For example, many of the museum may have a library. For example, if you go to the National Museum Kolkata, you, uh, you can find there a very beautiful library attached with it. Similarly, many big libraries may have museums attached with that. You go to National Library, they have very good, you know, uh, uh, museums. Uh, many uh, such libraries are there. Koda Box Oriental Public Library is there. Ram Raja Library is there. So, <clears throat> uh, but you can see that, that uh, whether a library and museum are working in the same information space, but those are retrieval silos. As a user, you know, need to go to the library search interface to retrieve library materials processed locally. And again, you go to uh, another retrieval uh, software uh, to find something about cultural heritage resources. And a separate software is there, a separate metadata standard they are following. So these are silos, airtight and watertight compartments with no link to each other, although they are operating in the same information space. So I'm, I am targeting this particular zone. But how we can make an integrated search retrieval interface, which is Google-like simple, as well as OPEC-like elegant. At the same time, you can have a feeling that it is very easy to search and retrieve something. And at the same time, you, you know that at any moment of time, if there is a complex need, I can switch over to the you know, advanced level uh, search interfaces. So this particular uh, you know, uh, domain is not an easy one. It's a complex one. So you can see here uh, the resource map. If I, uh, you know, uh, go for a slight, uh, you know, uh, focus, zoom, in, uh, zoom in, then uh, this particular domain includes many of the resources which we have not encountered previously. For example, library process records are there, museum resources, scholarly text means institutional repositories, musical object, moving image, geospatial data. Nowadays, you know, uh, data is very important uh, from the speech of Professor Ganguly. You can know that uh, that uh, interoperability of data sets is very important. So data sets are becoming very important object in the research communication cycle. Then there are many cultural heritage resources, archives and different, you know, uh, a piece of information is coming from the information industry, for example, publishing industry. So remixing of those kind of resources is a very, very complex zone. And uh, I am using here the resource map recently created by Jennifer Riley. So if we want to tackle these resources, this wide uh, you know, uh, domain of different type of types of resources, we need to have a very you know, uh, comprehensive metadata modeling. So what are the metadata standards available with us? As a library professional, many of you are from LIS profession, but those who are not from LIS profession, let me tell you that metadata is basically structured data about data. 
and the entire retrieval process depends on the quality of metadata. For example, for a book, the metadata are author, uh, year of publication, name of the publisher, title of the book, subject of the book, until and unless you do not uh, you know, have uh, uh, the processing of this metadata, you cannot offer a good retrieval system. So if you come to the metadata uh, mapping, so you can see if we want to manage this very complex uh, you know, uh, resource mapping, we need to have a secondary or hybrid metadata schema. One single metadata schema cannot support all kind of document like descriptive metadata we need, rights management metadata we need, structural metadata we need. Then we need different kind of content standard. We need metadata wrapper, for example, RDF uh, to include different secondary metadata schema into a package, different kind of interoperability format. So it's a very, very complex situation, both at the integration level as well as a standard which are required to integrate those resources. So apart from this complexity, uh, uh, if we come to the uh, you know, practical side of this integration, suppose as a library professional, I want to include different cultural heritage resources in my library, or similarly a museum library, a museum wants to include different kind of textual material uh, related to its paintings and other things. So here you can see there is a various uh, variety of interdisciplinary data related to cultural heritage resources. And uh, uh, you can, it can have painting, it can have maps, uh, different kind of data set, as I said. So typologically, format-wise, structurally, scale, scalability also differs. So again, producing silos. Because of these complexities, museum is maintaining a separate retrieval system, library is maintaining another one. So another, you know, preservation institute is maintaining another one. So uh, from the user point of view, it is basically running from pillar to post. We, we need to know for a book, I need to go to library. For a cultural heritage ob object, I need to go to a, another software. Metadata standard is different. Retrieval techniques are different. User interface is different. So we, uh, we are expecting a very you know, uh, you know, um, uh, comprehensive information such uh, skills from our general user. That is not true. And for user learning, uh, CARB is very, very steep uh, in this particular present silo dominated retrieval system. Apart from this uh, integration problem, another beautiful uh, you know, um, prospect, uh, the moment we make this integration is the contextualizing of resources. For example, if you see this particular example, this book deals about a painting. This painting is illustrated by this painter. This book also deals with this person. This person is a member of this particular council. So you can see N is to N relationship to relate different kind of diversified resources is also possible because of the uh, you know network data model. And uh, this is actually happening. It will help our uh, you know serendipity in information retrieval. We are searching for uh, something and a happy accident occurs. And I simply did not know it is available, but I accidentally you know, uh, accident in a positive sense, incidentally, uh, rather, uh, I can retrieve that if that network is, uh, is there. But it will not come automatically. We need to work uh, to ensure the serendipity in information retrieval. So uh, why contextualizing and are we ready for contextualizing? So if you see the uh, right from 1970s when personal computer first came into libraries, we started developing different bibliographic data model. Uh, all ISBDs are product of 70s and 71s because of the advent of personal, low cost personal computer in libraries. Then on the top of ISBD, we develop ACR2 and so on. 80s uh, dominated by database technology, year data modeling proposed in 1976, but unfortunately we never utilized uh, the backend RDBMS uh, uh, of our library software with its full uh, potential because we followed a uh, flat data model like ISPT. So uh, library professionals realized this particular fact in the early 2000s they came up with, you know, entity relationship data model like A for B or A for AD, A for SAD, BIP frame and so on. So entire bibliographic domain is now a trinity. Entity, 
attributes of those entities and relationship between entities. So now all the data model like LRM, RDA, and FRBR, FRAD are based on this you know basic model of Trinity entity attribute and their relationship. So on the top of that model, it is now possible to extend that particular model. So it's a lightweight uh, model what I'm showing you, uh, trying to show you here. It is based on uh, basically uh, CCO, uh, cataloging cultural object, and it actually again based on FRBR at the core. So on the basis of that particular model, and uh, you know, uh, mm, we can develop that kind of uh, you know contextualization and if you go through the latest ifla uh, library reference model which actually integrated FRAD, frad frcd they have given a basic user task the task is called to explore and the main objective of that particular uh, user task is to support serendipity in information seeking. So serendipity is becoming very important in the border landscape of GLAM, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Now, FRBR is supporting a lot of typology, relational typology like this. And you can have uh, the entire FRBR relationship typology from this vocab.org. So we have utilized that vocab.org. We found out some of the very good open source software that supports dark theory of connectivity, uh, zooming of the uh, relationship, and uh, you know, a directed acyclic graph all can also be created, something like this. This is a textual resource. Uh, somebody written it. It is his resident. Then uh, different kind of other relationship we can uh, create by using this kind of data model and this kind of open source software. So <clears throat> we uh, selected uh, a few software in the domain. We compared a uh, lot of domain specific software like Omeka, Collection Space, Archive Space, Collective Access, and Islandora. And on the top of this one, you can see I'm not going into details. After a comparative study, we know now that there are 22. Uh, Omeka got 22 points uh, because we uh, actually used a binary scale uh, one for support, zero for non support, and 0.5 partial support. So on the top of this, two software came with tying color. One is the archive space, another is Omeka. So both of so both of these software we have utilized to create uh, retrieval, uh, integrating retrieval silos, and uh, to show bibliographic relationship. Now uh, uh, let me go to the live mode. Uh, I am stopping it here in my presentation. And tell me, please, can you see my browser now? Can you see my browser now? Anyone, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, as you can see, we are utilizing uh, this archive space uh, as an open source uh, you know, cultural heritage management software. It's slightly different at the back end, it supports Lido. And then we are also maintaining uh, Omeka uh, as another digital library software. So here we have utilized this archive space to create an integrated retrieval interface. Say, for example, this is my library interface. I can search. Say, for example, I am searching for library. If I search for library, it is integrating institutional repository, library catalog database, or your ILS integrated library software or library automation software, archive space as a user management sort of thing, uh, like your uh, scholarly resources, open access resources, and so on. Now, the moment I search by this uh, library, you see what happens. So, a lot many uh, retrieval silos we are operating are integrating in real time here. And it will try to search the tram library and it will tell me the library catalog, there are 18 results on library. And if you go for this one, more catalog search, you can click here, representative record will be here. This is coming from my digital from this space, back in this space. This is coming from my archive space, that is museum object. So in same search interface, I can discover books and thesis related with the library, as well as different kind of cultural heritage resources related with the library. The moment my user click this finding it, it will, user do not have to know where to go. It will fetch that particular data from the uh, related object, and it can show you that these are the things available, and uh, I can go for the further one.
and I can full uh, study it. I can see this manuscript and everything. Manuscript is considered as a cultural resource. So this thing is possible. If I need an uh, ebook, uh, I can uh, click it here, and the ebook will be coming. If I know this particular book uh, from the library, if I click, so it will show the details of the book along with the rare availability of all the copies of the book. So my user do not have to go to uh, from this interest to that interest and everything. So yeah, Google like simple. Now, if my user needs, I want to search only library catalog. That option is there. That is the library catalog. Only three collections will be coming. Three libraries based on Koha. If I want only repository searching, that is also possible. Ebook, and if I want to search only museum object, then this is also possible. And different kind of browsing formats are there. So apart from this, uh, you can see this integrated, uh, you know, uh, uh, interface is possible because of different kind of open standard. We are harvesting all the backend software together and making a central index by using Apache Solar and the software I'm using is called ViewFind, a uh, well-known open source discovery system. Now the most critical part, uh, this is not that critical, the most critical part I'm coming that how we can contextualize the resources. So we also, uh, you know, conducted some of the experiment with uh, resource networking or bibliography-based distribution. For example, you can see it's typical document, Kitaseki, Nodinam. You all know uh, right from the West, uh, people from West Bengal, uh, 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 groundbreaking novel by Adolito Mollovarman. So it can handle multilingual resources. As if this book is copyright free, I integrate the entire book here in the digital library interface. But apart from that, you see, if we can utilize this one, it can additionally create a relationship map. If I click enlarge this one, so it will tell me that this Kistasikti Nodimnam is the primary reference. It's a scholarly resource attached with a person called Ronin Ayandotto and attached with two other uh, resources. So if I uh, select that, let us move this particular part. So it will uh, say that this is attached with two images. One is the illustration, another is the author. If I follow, no, uh, want to know about the author, if I click, the author-related document will be coming. It's a personal uh, profile. And this is a work of art, illustration made by Ronin Ayandotto. If I want to follow, let us see that uh, why, uh, what is this cultural object associated with this document. So the moment I click it, it will now load the resource network map of that particular object, which is a cover page illustration of Pita Sekhti Nodinna. Now, uh, again, it will uh, give me a lot many options to move from one interface to another interface. And now you see it is loaded. And if I select this one, so it now complete this entire network graph that this is an illustration illustrated by this person and this person illustrated another six painting and all these paintings are also available inside the library. So that kind of serendipity, that kind of resource, you know, integration is quite possible uh, through different kind of open standard, open source technology. And if there is a good theory, you know, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. We have a very interesting bibliographic data model like LRM, BibFrame, or FRBR. We have utilized mainly FRBR here. Different kind of uh, network, uh, you know, visualization, open source tools are there. Not many domain specific. Omeka is a digital library software uh, uh, in the cultural space. Similarly, archive space is a hardcore or um, core, you know, uh, archive management, museum management software, open source, and ViewFind is an again open source discovery system where we can explore this kind of uh, integration and this kind of bibliographic relationship based navigation. So that's all from my side. I think I'm on time. Thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you, sir. If there is any question, anybody to have any question or comment, observation, they can unmute themselves and talk. In the meanwhile, if I take this opportunity to at least convey my well conversation, uh, observation on that. Well, sir, uh, many things came rushing to my mind, which happens every time I listen to you. Some sort of, uh, I believe, some sort of universal grand scheme or um, has always been in the code of LIS as discipline and uh, in the heart of LIS professionals as in the field and the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, total 
thing is a very much democratizing in nature. So, uh, as uh, I can remember, the universal decimal scheme and the Falcom then always wanted to <coughs> create a universal catalog, perhaps, which was uh, curtailed by the uh, eventual fascist uh, takeover of the Belgium and and to afford the arrival of Triple uh, W. So librarians have always been a you know, foreseer or the pioneer of the things to come as far as data and knowledge curation and organization is concerned. In that context, and you also have said, sir, about uh, centripetous discovery, which is also common among the DH professionals who might work in a, uh, in a in, and, and uh, get the joy of uh, discovering something out of the far and dark corner of the library or the archive. Uh, these are uh, common to all of us. Um, but uh, when it comes to this, uh, you know, it's a very universal. Uh, scheme for say for uh, whatever name we may call it by metadata or anything like that uh, even uh, prior to that this catalog whatever uh, the, the, uh, 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 even uh, we have beautiful panelists uh, some of them are also have a uh, have this intention to create a universal um, schema for uh, archiving uh, where uh, the two metadata can interoperate and cross talk now my question is that some way this universal scheme can it Amar phone ta ei to abhi arekta phone yes please Raj. yeah so some way can that compromise with the uh, uh, plurality or the, the particular nature of certain locality or the multiple voice uh, can that be uh, can that compromise or make uh, make this uh, uh, multiple voice a little less or something lost May be uh, uh, maybe seen in there. This is my uh, <clears throat> yes, yes. I, I I am concerned with this. That is the uh, concept of plurality and um, uh, whether that uh, uh, that can affect our future, you know, uh, biasness in algorithm and any kind of thing. Say for example, search is always bias. It depends on algorithm. If you search uh, um, uh, by Google, I am giving you an example. You you simply search Google by nurse. N U R S E, nurse. We all know medical professionals. So always there comes the uh, uh, cute face uh, 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 girls with uh, dress of nurse. But are are not there any male nurses? Most of the uh, library, you know, hospitals are now are having the male nurses. But when you search Google for images or anything, it always shows that uh, girls are the uh, nurses. So that kind of biasness, uh, that may be you know uh, other way around also. That kind of search biasness is always there. So that's why I always prefer to use an open source software because I at least know what is written there, what kind of algorithm uh, they are providing, which particular object against the search will come first. So that kind of openness, that kind of at least you can read the software. Uh, uh, to know the algorithm. Otherwise, you simply uh, your algorithm is a black box, and you simply know what is happening, and all kind of biasness may pop up. So that you know possibility is always there. But uh, anyway, uh, my uh, you know uh, knowledge related to different kind of sociological aspect is always limited. I am basically 18 hours of a day I spent on my computer to you know because this uh, it may appear as a you know five minutes or ten minutes of presentation, but behind that my uh, you know uh, almost ten months of you know uh, hard work is there so uh, i nowadays i do not you know go into different kind of sociological aspect uh, issues and aspects so i'm not possibly the best person to comment on it so a lot of other panelists and in the future speakers you may ask this particular question but i uh, am aware that biasness in algorithm is always there but you have uh, clearly uh, made the point across and uh, the biases in algorithm, the gender and otherwise is also uh, get uh, reduced, if not removed totally, if the, uh, it is open source where technology do not dictate the human, rather it's the other way around as the sir mentioned and sir uh, in his work does that, as I know. Thank you so much sir for your enlightening talk. We are much, much uh, uh, enriched by your deliberation. Thank you so much. Now, Thank um, you.
Yeah, may I call upon our next speaker, Dr. Urjun Ghosh, <coughs> Professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He was formerly a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla. He has authored a history of the John Otto Moncho, Place for the People and Freedom from Profit, Issuing Copyright in Resistance Art. He has also joined the Indian Institute of Technology Jodhpur as an adjunct professor for the interdisciplinary research platform in the digital humanities for the years 2020-2021. He's a DH enthusiast, of course, and has uh, delivered talks on many occasions. He is our uh, keynote speaker for this session. Uh, sir, this, uh, Dr. Ghosh, is over to you, sir. Sir, you are muted. Yeah, thank you, yeah. uh, Rajeshri. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, now, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be to have been invited to speak today uh, because uh, some of the areas that I work in is, uh, I mean, the in the knowledge network, libraries and have historically been of great importance. And um, I'd also like to thank the principal of the college and the ELAN um, organization for uh, extending this invitation, organizing this uh, conference. And uh, I'm also very happy that I'm speaking after uh, Professor uh, Parthasharthi, because it seems that is the flavor of the day, this point about open source. Uh, you know, the, uh, the what, what open source actually brings to, um, brings to the table for uh, the implications and i am going to look at particularly a certain uh, issue which is which is political which is the north south divide and how the issue of open source uh, can can be crucial in in this in this context so uh, you know what are some of the concerns that i want to highlight is that with the digital right now you know um, the way i look at it it is uh, moving from uh, uh, from uh, it's an epochal shift that is uh, from print to digital it is not just like another media coming into being like you would have let us say the radio and then television and then uh, yeah, about before that newspaper etc which is like a shift of uh, 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 of of media but what we are happening is we're, what we are witnessing is a movement from the mechanical to the digital from the analog to the digital and that has tremendous implications and what we are also seeing is increasingly now a lot of uh, resources which were in the form of documents that is tangible you know paper and uh, material things are getting digitized through multiple ways and then we present it through a digital interface to the user so there is this question of moving from one domain to another domain and in this process, these, these objects can undergo a certain change in the way of where they are owned and the way they are collected and presented to the possible readership. That is, there is a possibility of privatization. That is, uh, articles which may have been commonly available uh, till, uh, till uh, um, uh, the mechanical or the physical state in the, the through the digitization may enter into a private domain in so much that it can create a, a certain kind of paywall or some kind of um, you know dependency right uh, kind of a dependency on a particular platform or whatever so and also the other thing is that these digital archiving also takes a certain amount of uh, input cost and because of the input cost, that it, this is the route through which privatization can happen. And this has tremendous implication. And th I will take you through some of the ways in which this kind of privatization can possibly happen. Is, uh, and what are the implications of it for future research in the humanities and social sciences, particularly. But before I do that, I would like to just deliberate a little bit on this distinction of, of how the documentary and the digital form are different from each other. But before I do that, this is not the first time this kind of an epochal shifting, ep epoch-making shifting is happening. 
uh, the movement to documentary practices from performative practices, you know, um, it, it was also something that happened uh, earlier. So if you think of performance, let us say oral, oral rendering of songs, pop, uh, theater, rituals, etc., they, uh, they also s serve a certain purpose towards uh, creation of a tradition of collecting knowledge and memory. So, um, you know, uh, communities would remember their past or, or, or place themselves within a tradition through these ritual exercises. And, and these were embodied acts. That is the ritual or the or the story or the song or whatever is getting that is getting performed is getting performed through the body of the person who is performing. As long as the person is there, then the performance is there. And, and it's, it happens through the interaction between the performer and the audience. Uh, uh, and and so uh, so I, I just would like to talk to you a little bit about my own background. I, you know, if you have um, heard Rajeshi's inter uh, 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 introduction of the when, he, when he spoke about my background, I mean, I primarily am a literature teacher and uh, I, I began with performance studies and moving closer towards digital humanities. So I'm going to speak from that perspective, right? So, you know, so th there is a way in which traditions can be traced through these performances and performance comes together when the audience and the and the performer is in the same same space. You know, there's a certain localization, a certain performance has a certain meaning in a particular location. You know, rituals can happen only in certain ritual locations. You know, they can be secular rituals like like let us say flag hoisting or Republic Day Parade. It doesn't happen everywhere. It happens at specific spots, you know, those kind of things. So, 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 so then a collection of, of performative practices form what is called a repertoire. And the repertoire is, is the building block of a tradition. So we can think of a repertoire as a kind of a, uh, of, of, of tool or, or a kind of a, a resource uh, which, which precedes the archive because the archive is the documentary practice. And when, when the documentary practice happens is that when, when I write a book, when, I, when there is an inscription, knowledge moves outside the body of the knower into a form or material form which can transcend uh, both the time and space. That is, the person may, may not exist, but the knowledge that that person created can continue to exist beyond that person. Also, uh, so that is in the case of, let's say, the Ashokan pillars or other kinds of inscriptions, the Rosetta Stone, etc. But when it is written in the form of a manuscript or printed in the form of a book, it, that that manuscript of the book can actually travel from one country to another the, without the person who has written the book traveling. So this creates a, 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 a exponential growth in availability of knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, first in manuscript form, then with printing. With printing, more uh, so the need for uh, bigger libraries and better metadata, et cetera, become necessary because you will have uh, a more number of, uh, each person will have access to more number of books. And having access to more number of books uh, means you have access to multiple viewpoints at the same point of time, which is which is at the, at the fulcrum of the creation of scientific inquiry. Now, so, uh, uh, you know, if we look at, um, you know, Documentary practices, you know, when 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 uh, people were uh, governments or officials were writing down um, articles, they were uh, uh, these these documents then became part of the archives. Now these archives, the physical archives, now have a certain implication. Now, if you took you think of India as a colonial um, uh, 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 as a uh, as a place where which was which was under colonial rule then you find that a lot of the papers documents that were created as part of the uh, uh, part of the colonial uh, administration later on become sources of knowledge in the future and you find a lot of that uh, east india company documents or, or the government of india documents now housed in in places like the india office library or the british library etc so if you want to know about india you will have to go to the british library sit there and so there is this possibility of that uh, there is that that case where when the archive becomes a source of uh, power 
uh, not only to frame the kind of knowledge, but through a selection process as to make what is to be made available and what is not to be made available, but also um, the fact that who who has the privilege to know. Now, if an Indian scholar wants to access that, that has to uh, there is a certain uh, certain certain cost involved, right? And it, it's there's a certain privilege involved. Um, so you can have Western scholars who can probably access these these uh, archives at a much easier easier sort of um, uh, without lesser effort. Now I want to discuss the coming of copyright a little bit uh, here because that is at the important point about uh, when I'm talking about open source and creative commons, etc. Uh, you know, copyright as a concept, without going into much detail, copyright as a concept actually emerges with print. This idea of who the author is, is something that emerges with print because before that there was never a doubt. Without Before documentary practices, before print, uh, there was never a doubt as to who the author is. Like we, uh, if I am giving this lecture and if we were if we were in the same conference room, you would never have a doubt as to who wrote who who is speaking, right? Because the person is there. It is only when uh, the the disembodiment of knowledge happens that the uh, that it becomes important to uh, the question as to who is the author becomes becomes important, right? Uh, and, and therefore, these, there there could be this dispute about whether whether this is an original work or this is a derivative work, etc. These questions keep coming in. And and uh, another thing that happens is that uh, with the coming of print becomes more more, more uh, you know this point becomes more succinct that there is this separation between the idea and expression. So when we read a book, a book is very different from a pen, for example. A pen is exactly a pen, right? It's not the idea of the pen alone, but but it is the pen. But when you think of the book, the book is at once a physical object, but what is important is inside is the idea. So my reading of the book does not prevent another person reading the same physical copy of the book. Whereas when I'm using a pen, I use the pen exclusively, right? So therefore, the possibility of proliferation of ideas uh, is, 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 is there. And, and in order to prevent that from happening, because the printer wants to get returns from the book, that that a print, printer has printed. I'm trying to put this in a nutshell. One can have a very long discussion on this, but uh, it is it is because of this historical uh, 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 need that copyright comes in, right? Uh, so copyright is contingent on on the on the on the on the coming of uh, of, of print, right? Um, because. On the one hand, there is the, the there is the possibility of abundance of knowledge when an idea is there. Everybody can have that idea, but at the same point, there is a need for creating a scarcity of the physical expression. But at the very point when copyright was uh, created, there were two points of paradox. One is copyright is always for a limited term. Now it's another matter that from 14 years to 28 years, and now life plus 50 or 60 years has become a very long period of copyright that has got extended, but in principle, it is still a limited term. So there is a notion that knowledge will ultimately move into the public domain in, in, in somewhere in the future horizon. Uh, and so there is a dichotomy. It is, it is private as well as public. At the same time, libraries have always been allowed to function to, 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 to keep books, to keep knowledge in that kind of a public domain, right? So that is that is the paradox that I want to exploit later on in my in my lecture. Now, when the with the coming of the digital age, you understand that one of the ways in which the internet was created was was the need of the Cold War uh, America, where the uh, the fear of a nuclear holocaust or a, a nuclear attack on military establishment, on research, et cetera, created what is called the ARPANET in the United States. And the ARPANET soon grew into a network of uh, mostly academic institutions, universities across the United States, where no single node will be uh, central or required for the rest of the network to function. So it is more kind of a distributed network. And this was a network which was malleable, which was which, which was created by scholars, scientists, 
for uh, for collective use and not owned by anybody hmm? uh, once again i am being deductive there are many nuances in this uh, which i am skipping just to make the final point that i want to make but over the last two decades or so the nature of the internet has undergone a significant shift due to um, due to conditions of two things one is the fact that due to the challenges that the uh, various governments across the world faced you know the arab spring and the occupy wall street etc where where in the internet blogs social media etc became important sources of mobilization uh, the uh, the government sort of woke up to the idea that you know they need to maintain a surveillance of the internet on the other hand uh, from, from the corporations there was a there was a, particularly the entertainment industry there was increased um, uh, uh, increased uh, sort of um, uh, desire to make sure that copyrighted material is not circulated among the uh, uh, you know freely right so uh, to stop piracy so both these concerns came together to create a surveillance industry so today the internet that has shaped is a kind of more closed internet where few corporations have have a certain role in them they maintain a certain kind of surveillance and they collect a lot of user data etc etc so if let us say now we have increasingly seen that certain server fails and then a large part of internet activity whether facebook instagram twitter this that everything sort of a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, online uh, uh, platforms etc they undergo uh, outage for a few hours or maybe half a day or so so now you have an architecture which is closed which which is dependent on large capital which was not the case when the internet was born the internet was envisaged as an open sort of thing right now in this context i must say that therefore we see that in the digital because it is not print it is possible here that we do not actually need copyright we do not actually we have can have an open architecture but because of the needs of the state and because of the need for capital because of the needs of profit in the last two decades the character of internet has has undergone a a, 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 a significant shift towards a more closed more um, uh, controlled sort of uh, uh of of uh, of uh, internet now what is this what does what is the implication i'll take a uh, few minutes to uh, wrap this up what are the implications of this over to for libraries and archives now when this digitization is possibility is happening uh, e is that there is a lot of digital scholarly repositories which are getting created where um, where you know either to existing uh, so these are documents with uh, which have moved from the documentary to the digital right uh, from the analog to the digital and there is a digitization process involved now uh, a lot of these are getting scanned and then put into repositories created user interface and then we as our our uh, libraries we are spending um, lakhs of rupees to access these uh, these resources number one uh, that is that is one thing number two is that many times scholarly uh, efforts are also uh, uh, being undertaken through projects uh, funding etc uh, to to actually do this digitization project but you speak to anybody who is running a digitization project there is a question looming in their head is that okay we will digitize it but you have to keep updating the server you have to keep on paying for the server space bandwidth this that and you have to keep on maintaining it you have to ensure that access is there that cost you may not be able to pay at any point of time so there is a danger of of these um, particular material moving behind a paywall somewhere in the future there is a there is a real danger of that happening so many uh, so in india mostly there are uh, the resources are very limited though the, there is the national um, digital library etc initiatives but the the scope of that is limited we still find many uh, indian archives or other they are handing over their material to western institutions and other places because and this uh, because of want of resources uh, uh, for digitization and 
there's a real danger of the, all these resources which are now accessible for the Indian scholar moving behind paywalls, right? Other than this, there is the bond digital content. Now you would know that archives would have those who work with archives, um, you know, uh, or even libraries, you know, letters of great people, correspondences, etc., become very important for for uh, you know uh, historical research for um, uh, uh, social sciences and humanities, etc. Now, what do we do with uh, let's say email? Who will have access to email because they are all in let's say with gmail or hotmail or whatever whatever how would you re retrieve that we need to think of these strategies what how will the history books of the future get uh, get written because even somebody's um, facebook feed or twitter feed etc can move behind a paywall right so when pages are memorialized they're they're completely up to these corporations to uh, uh, to to keep that in mind. Now, what this does is that there is this um, copyright wall, which is which is sort of created between the north and the south. The no north is historically become copyright rich, and we must keep in mind that even though the Berne Conventions etc. had come in, countries like the United States did not comply with the Berne Conventions. Uh, you know, we did not become signatory to the uh, uh, international copyright agreement. Still such time they became net copyright rich. So they first enriched themselves. They took all the knowledge from elsewhere, primarily from Europe, but also the rest of the world. And then they closed the doors to their kind of knowledge. So today you have a north-south divide. And we as libraries in the underdeveloped uh, world or developing world, we are, are spending our precious resources in acquiring some of these. And some of these resources which are held in our archives, even as of today, are getting digitized and put, put into this kind of interface. So I think it, and one of the things is that if we do not invest in open archives, then this cost is likely to grow, right? It, so open open source is not, uh, of course, Professor Parthasarpi is very correct in saying that we can scrutinize and see exactly how a certain thing is working, which is very important. But also the fact is then we can customize it. We can actually, the cost of implementation go, uh, is, we are not paying these royalty payments towards the towards these softwares uh, which are being developed. The software is de being developed by communities and they can be, and primarily also through government funding, etc. Why should we put this into uh, uh, behind behind this kind of paywall, which is going to actually lead to the advantage of 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 the of 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 the global north rather than the global south, right? Uh, I I give you as an alternative two uh, kind of platforms. One is that of Wikipedia which is one of the most highly used and I must tell you also trusted first source for many things. These, this is completely under a uh, Creative Commons license. We need to uh, stand up and take note of the experience of Wikipedia. And the other is something that we do, do not normally talk about in, uh, in academic circles and excuse me if some people think it is wrong, but you know, libgen. Now, one of the things that, let us not talk about what uh, Libgen does. Uh, I mean, but look at its architecture. That is what I am interested in. The fact that the code of Libgen is completely released. So there can be so many mirrors, right? And the data is completely released. Somebody, someone can take that data and uh, host it somewhere else. So even though a Libgen server is shut down, you will find it growing somewhere else. So the longevity of the data, the fact that you can nobody can shut that service down. This is very important. We need to, when we are digitizing, create mirrors. We need to have that kind of open interface that people can create this resource without any difficulty uh, at any point of time. A more distributed archive is what we, and, and library resources is what the global south needs in order to challenge the the uh, copyright wall built up by the north thank you thank you Urjunda, for this wonderful deliberation uh, yes uh, this is what happens uh, when the community laps up its own technology in in case of livegen
and Wikipedia also. It gets, uh, it, it reincarnates, uh, just like uh, when I call digitized material, I call it uh, reborn digital, not born digital, reborn digital. This is what happens when the community laps up its uh, technology or chooses its technology. So Libgen is one such example and a very nice one. Now, Shaindan, it's over to you for any question to the, to Ojinda and all. Shaindan? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajushi. Uh, sir, uh, I would just uh, thank you for a wonderful deliberation uh, which you have given and uh, your deliberation really touched upon the prehistory and uh, stories of archives and uh, obviously even today's internet. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask you a, a very a pertinent question pertaining to your topic that uh, do you find a certain dilemma of any kind in digitalism and how do you see surveillance going from here to further knowledge deriving out of the internet society. Surveillance going, uh, furthering knowledge. Uh, I didn't understand that last point. Now, how do you see surveillance going from here to further knowledge uh, deriving out of the internet society? Okay, okay. He means to say, I guess, the future knowledge information uh, society and something like that. I guess. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a hegemonic position, you know. Right now, yeah. uh, the way the internet architecture is, it is actually um, uh, actually empowering the, the 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 few who control the internet, right, and. Uh, the, and and I think that uh, the copyright wall or the or the or the mechanisms of copyrighted material, etc., they are the fulcrum around which this power is exercised. I'll give you a simple example. There are so many researchers, including all of you, in in this uh, meeting. We are pay, uh, our salaries are usually paid by our employers who in most cases would be the uh, government employers or uh, whoever uh, we are working for. Our, our uh, service conditions require us to publish and publish in certain journals because they are listed here or there. Who is preparing this list? This list is being preparing by our seniors only, right? Within the academic council, there's that various things. Now, I am when I'm writing, submitting this uh, article to the journal, the journal is not paying me anything. Mm? They are not primarily the ones who are funding the research, but they take the article. But then when our libraries collectively want to get back that knowledge which has been produced by scholars like us, we have to pay this hefty amount to them. Now, who is sustaining this model? This model is being sustained by us only. We who are who populate the academic councils or the senates or the board of studies or the selection committees, we are the ones who are creating these lists, etc. And we are increasing, we are putting this cost burden on our libraries. So, so this is something we need to point ponder about. We can, if you have to create a uh, free, uh, free, uh, not, uh, free knowledge uh, exchange for the global south, you need to think of a different architecture. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful deliberation once again. Uh, after uh, Dr. Ghosh's deliberation, uh, next uh, we would like to go for a lunch break. And definitely we'll meet at 1.55 p.m. with the further speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ajinda. Thank you so much. Let us get back to, to yeah. Yeah, keep the meeting open and get back to the to PM Sharp after lunch. Okay, okay, fine.